Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I am your host, Dr. Angela Gunchester. You know what I like to do on my show. I want to enlighten you. I want to inspire you. I want to empower you to become your best self. Now, scripture reminds us that the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And today, we want to get you fired up about cancer and kicking it to the curb. Hey, my guest today is Carol Neely, and we are talking about her book, Kicking Cancer to the Curb. Now, you know that I am definitely going to enjoy this conversation with her as a breast cancer survivor myself. I can't wait to chit-chat with her about her book. So, you know what I'm going to tell you to do next? Go on. Get comfy, get cozy, get your coffee, or get your tea, because we are about to get started. Good morning, Carol. Thank you so much for joining me for our Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. Good morning. Happy to be here. So, as is the custom around here, we always give our authors the opportunity to introduce themselves to our listeners that may be unfamiliar with who you are. So, if you could, please, can you give us a a quick bio of who is Cal Neely? Well, I'm a retired nurse with a 45-year career behind me that I love. And uh, in addition to that, I always loved uh, drawing, painting, and writing. Uh, I live in Central Florida with my husband, Gene, and my rescue dog, Flora. And I have two grown daughters and four grandchildren. I love it. Now, my mother, too, is uh, a retired nurse, so I love the fact that you guys have such caring hearts. And the fact that you have a rescue dog, that says a lot about who you are as well. I, I love that. I love that. Now, being an author, is that something that you have always wanted to do, or did you find that you simply had to share your story? Yes, I I never thought about being an author. I mean, I was always writing, uh, but it was things for school and things for friends. And, you know, I never gave thought to uh, publishing a book. But after my experience with uh, cancer and the chemotherapy and all the things that go with it, I, I learned so much that despite being a nurse, there were things I didn't know about cancer. And I, I truly felt compelled to share that information, to close the gaps, and to clarify all the misinformation that's out there. So um, it became a passion of mine to to write the books I wrote and uh, and get that information out there. And the feedback I've gotten tells me that it was truly needed, and people appreciated it. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, when you speak about uh, your recovery um, of cancer, do you use the word uh, remission or do you use the phrase cancer-free? I will never be able to use the phrase cancer-free because um, stage four is uh, incurable. It's a terminal condition. Um I tend to think of myself as a thriver, as somebody, I I did go into complete remission after chemo, and about three months ago, the cancer became active again, so I'm back on treatment and hoping to go back into remission. But um, regardless of that, I I feel like I'm thriving, I'm living my life, um, and just taking it all a step at a time. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, the title of your book, Kicking Cancer to the Curb, how did you come about that name for your book? Well, it was just sort of the attitude I adopted because by then I had been living in cancer land for about five years and I I was no longer cheerful or, you know, down. I was feeling strong. I, I was getting into the advocacy role, um, learning to become my own best self-advocate. 
In other words, being a very active part of my treatment team, asking questions, challenging things, learning all I could about my disease and about the medications I was on. And then I uh, began going to some conferences, joining some groups, and just uh, trying to advocate in general for people with cancer and um, trying to help um, press the issue of the need for more research funds because um, we still have a lot of people dying. In the United States, 42,071 people died last year of metastatic breast cancer, and that's 116 people a day. So I I don't think that's acceptable. I think we need to do a lot more and a lot better. Absolutely. I could not agree with you more there. We definitely need to do the the most that we can when it when it comes to this. Now for for so many people they are fearful of hearing the C word. Um, they're experiencing uh, what they're experiencing, the way that they feel. They go to the doctor uh, and they put that off for quite some time because they fear being told that they have cancer. What helped you emotionally to get through hearing that you have not only a cancer diagnosis, but that it was stage four? Well, it's a very difficult thing to hear, as you said, but I, my husband and my daughter were with me when I heard those words. And as, as shocking as it was, I could see that my husband and my daughter were beginning to cry and it was, um, it was a shock to them. So I became the strong one and, uh, kind of broke the ice and said, well, you know, it could be worse. It could be better, but it could be worse. And we went on from there and started talking about my treatment plan. But as you move along, you know, you truly need the support of your family and friends. You need to um, try to surround yourself with positive people, not people who will drag you down. And I think it's important, despite the people around you, that you need to develop um, an inner faith and inner trust in yourself to endure what you're facing, I found prayer to be a very powerful thing. My prayers and the prayers of my friends and family, uh, I just felt that um, God was taking my hand and was going to lead me through this. I was going to be strong and I was going to stay on top of things as much as possible and and work my way through it one day at a time. Um, I did reach a point around Christmas time, I was about three months into my diagnosis, when I sort of felt I was at a, had the blues, I, I, I hit a low, I think it was, you know, the holidays, thinking about my grandchildren. Uh, and there was a 1-800 number, and I called it, and uh they had someone with my exact diagnosis because I have bone metastasis uh, to call me. And the first thing she said was that she had been surviving now for nine years with this diagnosis. Well, that just lifted me right up. I thought, wow, she's still around and active at nine years. So I thought, heck, I can do that, you know. So we had a wonderful, lengthy conversation. She answered all my questions. And there is nothing like talking to someone who is walking in your shoes because they truly know what it feels like. They know what you're facing. So their tips, their advice, and their support is is geared so much to what you're going through that it's it's just invaluable. Absolutely. I know that you are you are so right with that. And one of the things that I really appreciate it was having um that that sister time or having that support time of uh, other women who had gone through it and how they could encourage us to to keep going that it would be rough you know but but to just keep me moving forward and to try to stay positive so i yeah, I think yeah, yeah, there's no going back I, I tell people keep moving forward no you can't go back uh, there is nothing there for you you need to 
keep looking ahead. Absolutely. 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 Now, most people are familiar with um, uh, that there are various stages of cancer, but they may not understand that there's a stage one to A to B, three and four. Um, did your doctor go through all of the stages and explain the, the stages with you so that you understood exactly what was going on with your body? Or how did you um, come to understand what your stage was and what it meant? Well, my doctor did explain my stage, um, which is the, the highest level you can go to and that it had already spread um, in other parts of my body. Uh, being uh, a retired nurse, she knew that I was familiar with the earlier stages, but quite frankly, I went through the the booklets she gave me. I went through the pamphlets I got from the American Cancer Society. You still need to make sure that you understand everything and that you read and learn about your illness as much as you can. So I fortified what I already knew with with all these materials and asking my doctor questions. I always go in, I advise everybody, go in with your little list of questions and if you can't have somebody take notes for you because you want to be engaged actively in that conversation and not sitting there writing everything. And it would be um, shocking to me afterwards. My daughter took notes and I would go through them and I would say, you know, I don't even remember her talking about that. Because your mind can can wander a little bit. You're going through a, an incredible time in your life and you don't hear everything. So it, I think it's um, it's important that people do that. Absolutely. I, I cannot agree with you, with you more, that it is nice to have someone there with you <clears throat> that can help you write down, write down those, those little things. Because you do have a pause. You know, your attention uh, starts to deviate just a little and you go, oh my goodness, I can't believe that they just told me that I have cancer. Or uh, you have a yeah. question and they something and it, and it totally, completely surprises you. My listeners have heard me talk about that too. When they said it, you know, I had tears that streamed down my face. Um, I blinked and the tears came and I told her, don't forget the tears. How do I get better? What What's the next step? Like that's just my human reaction. But like yeah. you say, I'm, I'm a fighter. I'm someone who keeps moving forward. And I love that about you. You keep moving forward. Let's not stay stuck there, but keep moving forward. And you really do, you really do have to. Thank you for reminding someone of, of that. Now, were you the type of person that, um, that was going to the doctor, did you feel that you were a healthy person, you were doing everything that you were you were supposed to be doing? I know that I was uh, too young to have even been told that I needed a mammogram. So I wasn't doing that yet, but I thought that I was a healthy person until I wasn't. What is What was your story, your discovery story like? Well, it's something I think that's important for everybody to know so it doesn't happen to them. I did get mammograms every year from age 40 to age 65, and unfortunately, in my case, they were kind of 25 years of worthless tests because I have very dense breast tissue. I wasn't aware of that until my diagnosis, but my doctor told me they would see all these clouds um, that were hiding um, the tumors, the dense breast tissue, uh, comes uh, on the film as clouds, and a tumor will do the same thing. So my doctor told me it's like looking for a snowball in a snowstorm. So what you need to know, and actually the radiologist is the only person in the world who knows if you have dense breast tissue, and they need to tell you if you do because more than likely you're going to need a, uh, an ultrasound, which would show whether or not you have tumors. I never was... Uh, referred for an ultrasound or an MRI. So I just kept having mammograms and my doctor said that the yeah. tumor was growing for years in my left breast and then it jumped to the right breast and then it went through the bones in my body. So by the time, and I found 
the tumor in the shower only because I had an itchiness. And I never knew itchiness could be a symptom of breast cancer, but it is one of them. And I had to probe very deeply in that breast to get to the source of the itchiness. And here I found a long, hard mass that I would never have been able to palpate, and it was a lobular tumor. So um, women need to know about the density of their breasts. And I did help here in Florida. Um, when I went to Tallahassee, I met with uh, congressmen and senators, and we got the law passed here. And currently the law was passed in 36 states, but we need all states to sign up for the Dense, um, Dense Breast Act. That act says that the radiologist must tell you if you have dense breast. Uh, he must um, refer you for either an ultrasound or an MRI, and insurance must pay for it. Absolutely, absolutely, because we should not have to uh, risk our lives simply because um, it hasn't caught up to where it should be. Absolutely. Right. Well, Carol, it is time for us to take a very short break, but before we do, can you please remind everyone of the title of this book, Where Can We Get a Copy, and How Do We Stay in Contact with You? Kicking Cancer to the Curb is available on online at Amazon, Books a Million, and Barnes and & Noble. And uh, you you can go to my website, www.metastaticmadness.com. I also have a Facebook page, um, also called Metastatic Madness. Um, I'm on Alrighty. Twitter Alrighty, as well. Everyone. Now you know where you can get a copy of the book. We'll be back right after this. are back. Thank you so much for joining me for our Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I am your host, Dr. Angela Budschester. My guest today is author Carol Neely, and we're talking about her book, Kicking Cancer to the Curb. Now, my next question for you, Carol, is um, as far as trying to keep a sense of balance, when we're going through our treatments, um, treatments can kind of become everything that we do and trying to get to our good day, you know, not feeling bad or, or not dealing with the, the issues of illness, but just trying to get to that, that sunshiny day. Did you have to uh, reprioritize anything in your life to help you learn to, um, to, to make every day of your life? more enjoyable while you were still going through the process of chemotherapy and all of that? Well, you do tend to reprioritize because everything has changed pretty much in your life. Uh, I'm fortunate that I have a husband who can cook, and he also learned how to read labels. We talked about the fact that I was going to need more protein to help rebuild all those cells that were being knocked out by the chemotherapy. And he would be sure to get me high-protein drinks and foods that uh, had a lot of protein in them. You need a lot of rest. And uh, fortunately, I have this rescue dog who she had been abused and abandoned, and we took her in. And uh, I couldn't have a more loving uh, chemo buddy than my dog, Flora. So she always kept me company if I had days when I really just couldn't get out of bed till much later in the day, and she would just stay with me. And so it's important for you to have something to get you through those periods when you really can't get up and do anything, whether you read, you. I do a lot of crossword puzzles to combat chemo brain and keep my, my mind sharp. And, you know, you need to have things in place. You need to have your will updated. You need to have an advanced directive, um, a durable power of attorney, so that you're not going to have to worry about those things later on. So you get all of that on the way, out of the way. And, you know, I um, kind of throw out a lot of things I was hanging on to that I didn't need. I um, just kind of uh, took stock of my life and, and said, well, what's really important? So my husband and I 
flew off to Italy for our anniversary and had a great time. And the following year, I said, I'm still here. Let's celebrate. We went to Hawaii for my birthday and Christmas. My birthday falls on Christmas Day. So it was a double ceremony. So you need to celebrate those things in life, um, even if you have an incurable disease, because every day counts. Yes, it does. And oh my goodness, what a beautiful way to to celebrate life. We do need to learn to live it uh, more, to to enjoy uh, people when we when we still have them in their presence. You know, we think about it and we talk about people so lovingly when we move thousands of miles away for them. Oh, my family was so wonderful. But when you were right next door to each other, ah, my family. You know, or yeah. or you wait until you, you know, or you wait until uh, you you've gotten older to appreciate the fact that you had your siblings in your life or whatever it is. So you are so right. We do need to take time to to celebrate those things and, and to be with the ones that we love more often. I love that. Now, unfortunately, many of the stories that we hear when um, I talk to women about their breast cancer journey, they do have some some bits of disappointment in that they were disappointed that um, geographically it was hard to get to their breast cancer center or uh, financially insurance didn't want to cover a particular drug. Uh, psychologically, there were not those support groups there or anyone to really talk to them and help them process what was going on, so on and so forth. Um, Did you find that there were any hurdles in in your care? And if so, what did you do to try to alleviate those hurdles? Well, you know, the, the trip to the cancer center was always a little rough because my entire chemo was throughout the winter months. I started in November and ended in March. And I lived in a very mountainous area where there was a lot of ice and snow. So we would leave, it would be dark out, and when we came back at the end of my chemo day, it would be dark again. Those were tough times, but at least I was able to travel by car to get my cancer to my cancer center. I'm, I'm sure there are people who may have to take trains or planes or whatever because they don't have cancer centers that are close. I I think everybody should know that there are social workers at every cancer center, and they can be very helpful in finding resources for you, whether it's financial resources, whether you need um, contact with Share a Ride. There are some organizations that will pick you up and take you uh, to to, uh, the cancer center. There's, There's a lot more help out there than some people would really realize and and psychologically as well you may need to have some counseling um i know that um i i had some low periods i went on um an antidepressant uh, one month into my diagnosis because i found i couldn't say i have cancer without breaking down and crying and i thought i i can't be like this i need to pull myself together and it helped me. It was a mild uh, tranquilizer that's been around a long time. I had no side effects, and I, it just really picked up my mood. So I could try to feel as normal as possible and, and to carry on conversations. So um, there are, are many uh, foundations and organizations also that will help people financially um, many of the pharmaceutical companies have, um, some of them call it uh, compassionate care and there are other terms, but they often have uh, a financial arm that will help pay for your meds or some some part of your treatment. I think it's important that people explore these things, go to a social worker and find out what's out there. There's there's so much for cancer patients now that I wasn't even aware of. Mm-hmm. And you are you are so right about that. And thank you for mentioning that there are uh, social workers there if you if you need any type of uh, resource. I want to mention one other thing. Um, I mm-hmm. think cancer patients need to know this, and I'm 
not trying to frighten you or anyone else, but despite having successful treatment with slash poison and burn, science has demonstrated that 30% of patients who were successfully treated, <coughs> excuse me, uh, will have a recurrence and uh, may metastasize. Absolutely. <coughs> And you know, the, the good thing about my listeners is that, um, I don't think that it necessarily frightened, that it will frighten them, but instead, I think that it will encourage them to, if you know someone, if it's, if it's you or someone that you love or know, and they are dealing with a particular stage, find out what the, what the staff are for that stage. And it will help you. You don't want to go with just that that general information because it may not be true for your loved yeah. one because they are in a different stage. So you they you need are to remain so vigilant. Right. They need to know what the signs might be of Absolutely. metastasis or recurrence and make sure they keep up with all their uh, appointments Absolutely. and mammograms and all of that. Some people have metastasized as long as 20 years after they were treated successfully and they were shocked. Well, those cancer cells were still in their body. They can remain dormant for years and that's why we need more research. We don't know what triggers them to form a metastasis or to spread to another organ or part of the body. Uh, one woman uh, suddenly developed shortness of breath, a little bit of pain in her chest and when they examined her, the fluids in her chest, they found breast cancer cells. So 20 years after successful treatment, she had metastasis to her lungs. It wasn't lung cancer. It was breast cancer that spread to her lungs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I think it is so important that we do our research. I know that that was something that I did. I, I consumed Good. the information that my oncologist gave me, but me being the type of person that I am, research does not frighten me. I went out and found more information. I wanted to be in the know so that when they talked to me about my treatment plan, I knew exactly what they were saying. And if I had a question, then at least I had a general idea of what they may say. But let's go even deeper. So you are you are so right. But I wanted to also thank you for, for reminding everyone that there are their, um, those additional modalities that we can use that can bring a sense of calm and peace to, to our bodies. We do need to do that acupuncture if you are, are going to get Get, you know, massage, let your masseuse know, I'm a breast cancer, I'm, I'm either a survivor, I'm going through it right now, so that they can give you the proper uh, type of massage for that. There are so many things that yeah, you can do. I'm, I have um, met mm -hmm. in, in some of my ribs, and I was going through a lot of rib pain. The, it had, had mm -hmm. just been aggravated, um, and my uh, oncologist and my pain specialist tried various things. Nothing was helping me. So five months into having this pain in my chest that every time I took a deep breath became sharp and hurt quite a bit, I went to an acupuncturist who happens to be very good and stu studied in the Orient, and she put two needles in my uh, this little finger on each hand, and I left there after one treatment with no pain, and it never came back. So oh, I was wow. just blown away by that, and I thought, you know, we really do need to think about these other forms of treatment that could augment our traditional treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a good way to go. And if it can, if your body, make sure you're doing the best thing for you, you know. So don't, don't just, you know, stay in the box because that's where someone else is comfortable. You know, uh, think, mm -hmm. get all of the medical care that you possibly can. And thank you for reminding folks. I know that that was something that I did as well. You're right that that quiet time, that medication, meditation time, that prayer time, that just being mm -hmm. in your favorite place time. I'm a beach baby. Um, so being in Long Beach, I was able to go to the beach and just sit and be with God, the waves and the seagulls. Yeah, and just very so therapeutic. Keep, 
heal myself. Absolutely. So I, I thank you for that reminder. For Carol Mealy, I have enjoyed my time talking with you today. Um, it's always great to have someone who, um, who understands what you've been through, but it's, it's also nice just to, uh, share sometimes because we can empower others who perhaps didn't think about a particular thing just in sharing our story. So thank you for coming on, for your bravery of still continuing to talk about it and not keeping it to yourself, but instead helping as many men and women out there as as you possibly can. Thank you for sharing your book with me. Oh, you're quite welcome. And thank you for giving me that opportunity. We need to spread these words out further so everyone is on the same page. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, before I let you go, you are not just the author of one book, but you have actually written two books. Um, can you remind everyone what what are the titles to your two books? Where can they get a copy? And if someone wants to reach out to you, what's the best way to do that? Metastatic Madness about coping with stage four is what is the first book, and the second book is Kicking Cancer to the Curb. They are available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Books a Million. And my website is www.metastaticmadness.com, and my Facebook page is Metastatic Madness. Thank you again, Carol, for being a guest on the show today. You're very welcome. And listeners, thank you for spending time with us here today as well. We appreciate your tuning in, and we hope that we have enlightened, inspired, and empowered you. As always, may the Lord continue to shine his face upon you. May you receive his grace and his mercy in all that you do. Until next time, everyone, remember that you, you are blessed in the Lord. Have a great day, everyone. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I am your host, Dr. Angela Butchester. You know what I like to do on my show. I want to enlighten, inspire, and empower you to become your best self. The scripture reminds us that the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And today, we want you fired up about God, about self-love, about self-help, patience, and grace. Our author today is Sherelle Landers, and we are talking about her book, A Series of Unfortunate Events. So you know what I'm going to tell you to do. Go on, get comfy, get cozy, get your coffee, or get your tea, because we are about to get started. Good morning, Sherelle. Thank you so much for being on Daily Spark with Dr. Angela today. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for being on. Now, before we get started talking about your book, as it is custom here, we always give our author guests the opportunity to introduce themselves to perhaps the few people out there that are unfamiliar with who you are or what you do, what your work is about. So can you give us a little, um, a little introduction into what makes you you? Yes, my name is Sherelle Landers. Um, I was an, of St. Louis native. Um, I started writing like at the age of seven. Um, then, um, like very gifted and talented. I've never received like a bad review like on my writing. So I decided to embark on a journey of writing a book. And um, it started out being like a life story, but then in turn turned into like, well, we don't want to bash anybody as like protective things. So I in turn start going to church and seeking spiritual guidance. And that's when I decided to write for God. And in that journey, I have become like um, just a prospect of what I wanted to become and enlighten and empower myself and others in the midst of hard times and trouble. And also wanted to be encouraging and uplifting during the hard times. Is being an author something that you've always wanted to do, or did you find that it was just what life presented to you? Um, it was a little bit of both. Um, like I said, I've been writing since the age of seven. Um, started out in second grade. I wrote a poem about a, a dog and a uh, and a mouse. And um, 
my teacher is like, well, you can really go far. Then in high school, um, I would write stories, like little short stories in, in my English composition class. And then they would, like, people would be like, oh, this sounds so real. Then I would go from stories to poetry. And, like, I dab in, like, the creative world and all kind of aspects. Like, I've been creative for, um, I guess, since I've been born. Um, but just always had a gifted way with words. Um, so, yeah, it's just always something that I wanted to do, though. I love it. I love it. And I, I, I always ask that question because you just never know. You know, um, so many people have said, absolutely not, kind of stumbled upon it, or, you know, God told me I need to write the book, so I wrote the book. But for the people who this is a passion, have kind of been like you, you know, something that you've known from a very early age, um, that you have a love for writing, kind of like with me and and ministry. It, it was something that I've always known that I wanted to do. So I, I totally, completely, completely understand that. Definitely, definitely. Now, the title of your book, A Series of Unfortunate Events, a curious title. Can you tell us, how did you come about that title? Well, I went from um, many different titles, I stormed through many different titles, and as I was writing the book, I was like, this is, like, seriously unfortunate. Like, it's seriously unfortunate that we are born in battles that we are not prepared to face, that we are born unprepared to embark on journeys in life that God, only God can prepare us for through his grace and through his mercy. And the only way that we can really be able to captivate our true selves is through perseverance and resilience, only through his covenant and stronghold that he promises us and it's just like it's it's unfortunate you know he says the many the many afflictions of those of the righteous and it's just like you go through so much you endure so much in life and you know trying to be a good person trying to love people and in their darkest hours and it hurts you know like pain is just like a significant amount of life that has to that we have to endure in order to find out who we truly are and i was like this is a serious like it was like a series of unfortunate events you know i totally understand that and thank you so much for for that explanation because it really and truly does help us to understand but but you're right like people do sit there and we will say those things like are you serious like this is horrible this is really this is really something like this isn't something to play with and the the title totally completely makes sense when you explain it from from that aspect i love it now when you were putting it all together and you have it packaged to present to the world did you have a particular reader in mind like did you write this for uh, young adults, like including people that are that are in their twenties, did you um, have more so of maybe folks need to have lived a little, like they they have they need to have gone through some stuff too. Who is your ideal reader here? Um, I just I just personally wanted to heal and I wanted to help. Like I've given my book out, like personally, like I've read like some of the book, but I haven't read like all of the book. Like, I've gave my, my free copies away um, just to, like, people that are just, like, struggling, like, young people that are, like, faced with drugs, um, like, just battling, like, addictions and, you know, just always try to be an inspiration to those around me because I only feel like it can only get greater. You know, God has blessed me, and sometimes my words are a blessing and a curse, but I just feel like, you know, it's just it's just time to start blessing, you know. It's just time to use them for the greater good than what they can be used for when you're angry or hurt or trying to express yourself through, like I say, pain and affliction. So it was just like, um, I, I, I started out on a spiritual journey, you know, and God was like, well, you got to empower, you know, that's what he kept telling me, you know, I was like, well, you know, asking him what's my purpose, which I already knew what my purpose was. And he was like, well, you're a poet, but I want you to empower. I was like, empower. He was like, yeah. And he gave me the, um, he broke down and empower, like, and he was like, words encourage and restoration. Like, oh, okay. So it's just like, you know, sometimes when God gives you things, it could take years and years before you actually walk in and to fulfill what he's designed to, to give you. But he, um, yeah, that's, that's the word he gave me was to empower. And so I just embarked on that journey and I started writing from a spiritual standpoint and just telling my story, like, just, you know. 
Absolutely. Well, I am so glad that you that you followed through because we need to share those stories and especially those stories where we feel that they're, you know, that God is tugging on our heart saying, hey, listen, you really need to make this happen. Because even though it's about you, um, it's really about someone else. Meaning right. that right. someone down the line, you know, needs to needs to be able to read read your story. Now, with many of the authors that we have on and, and they're sharing stories, um, some of it is about them. Uh, some will say, well, it's a mixture of my life or you know situations that I've seen in in the world in general, and it became a part of the story. How did you choose uh, which parts to? Uh, make fictional or non-fictional? How did you come up with, with the blend of your story? Well, it was when I started doing the publication through um, my publisher, and they were like, well, we want to protect you. I was like, okay, well, I can change the location and, you know, different things because, like, I don't come from a great background. Like I said, I was raised in St. Louis, Missouri. My parents aren't the best people in the world. Like, I love my mom to death, but it was more so to protect me from my father who's been in incarcerated my entire life, who has done things like he got out of prison in June and he was just so like um, really adamant about staying with me. And it just, in turn made my life a living like chaotic, you know, like I had a nervous breakdown and everything just went like, I feel like everything went according to God's will, you know, and he moved me according to how he, he wanted to move me. He protected me according to, how I needed to be protected. So it was more so of a, well, you have to take this necessary step if you really want to protect what you have going. Like, don't get it twisted that everything in this story is absolutely true to the best of my knowledge. And um, my purpose is definitely was definitely to heal. It wasn't to bash anybody or to make my parents look bad. But, I mean, you have to tell the truth the way the truth has to be exposed. And the only way to expose the devil is in light, you know, so... Absolutely, absolutely. And I can understand that, you know, writing is a process. It's one of the things that um, anyone who who utilizes my services as a therapist, journaling is one of the things that you're simply going to do. Um, Not because I think that everyone needs to be an aspiring author, but because to, you know, get those thoughts out of your head and and separate yourself from those thoughts so that you can uh, walk down the process of, of healing a little bit faster than if you were trying to hold it all together uh, in your head. We, we need to free up some of that so that you can go for healing. So I definitely, definitely understand that. Now, if you could change some things in the world, um, and, and I think as little kids, when we're asked this question, you know, if you could do anything, you know, what would your three wishes be? And we wish for, you know, those two things. I want every day to be Christmas or, you know, I want it to be my birthday every day. Uh, we don't think about changing the world to um, eradicate it of some stuff that's going on. As a cancer survivor, I would definitely say I'd rid the world of cancer. What, what, things would you do if you could change the world and you could see that manifestation with your own eyes? What do you think you would do? I would definitely um, elaborate on peace. I feel like the world needs to be together and on an equal combative playing field of not just justice, but just like all around love and peace. You know, if we generate more of God's love into the world, then there's no other way that we can fail each other. You know, so many people are in, in competition with having the best or, 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 or obtaining this. And, and like you say, it's, it's people suffering every day from cancer and diseases and, you know, technology is, is taking over. I feel like if we implement the love of universal love and divine, divine love, then peace, you know, that'll be my only thing to give the world with, would be peace. Absolutely. And, you know, you have definitely said a mouthful there because when we think about it, when, when folks get irritated and upset and things are going wrong, they, that's, that's one of the things they ask for. I just want some peace. You know, I right. want peace. I want quiet. I want some happiness. I want some joy. 
uh, we, we want all of that, that chaos and confusion to just get out of our lives. And you are, you are so right. No one ever says, give me drama instead of peace. People want peace. You are, yeah. you are definitely on to something there, I, I tell you. Now, sharing your gift with, um, with yourself is, is one thing, of course. But you, you've prepared to share your gift with, with others. Um, and you, and that's something that you, that you talk about. Can you expound a little bit more on that? Um, like I say, it's been poetry. I have poetry in so many different areas, like a battle through homelessness, um, abuse, um, domestic abuse, and like just always writing was my escape. You know, I have journals and journals full of poetry, and journals and journals full of short stories of like even urban stories. You know, just like so many different ways that I can utilize my words. You know, and just being able to share whether it's off the top of my head or whether it's from the center of my heart. You know, God put, God wakes me up in the middle of the night, three in the morning. He's like, well, write this, you know, and it's like, okay. Or he gives me a word to just ponder on until I figure out what the definition really means. And it's just like, okay, you know, so it's just more so as to being able to act without reacting, you know, so it's just more so being able to put something on there permanent because words words last a lifetime whether people think so or not you know words last a lifetime I mean we can always go in history and look for something that somebody has left us to be able to learn from and I believe that's what generate generates wisdom and as long as we are generate generating wisdom then there's no end of tomorrow you know Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, you are you are so right. You know, words do last a lifetime. Um we we quote other people, we we quote people that that we have never met, that our parents have never met, you know, from from people uh that lived during a year that looks like it's someone's age, not not a, a year, you know, uh in in the time of, of what we think of. So you're you're right. But also the things that the people that we love that they say to us, they they yeah. tend to last longest within our lifetime. You know, when someone says that that you are beautiful, we remember that. We take that to heart. We also remember those mean, ugly, nasty things that people say too, and that can that can take us a lifetime to try to get over. So you are you are so. Well, Sarah, it is time for us to go to a break right now, but. We will definitely come back and continue this conversation. Before we go, though, can you remind everyone what is the title of your book, where can we get a copy, and how do we stay in contact with you? Yeah, the title of my book is A Series of Unfortunate Events. Um, It's on all major bookstores, Amazon, Kindle. um, You can Google it. You're going to find it. Um, The pen name is Jessica Wright. Um, If you are looking for the book, it's not under Sherelle Landers. Um, you can stay in contact with me. Um, have a Twitter page, uh, Miss Authoris, um, at Miss Authoris. On Twitter, everything is public. Um, feel free to contact me. Um, yeah. All righty, listeners. Now you know where you can get a copy of the book. We'll be back right after this. We are back. Thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I am your host, Dr. Angela Butchester. My guest today is pen name Jessica Wright, and she has written the book, A Serious of Unfortunate Events. And I am so excited to have her on the show today. Now, Joelle, my next question for you is about time. Um, time can can be our friend and time can be our enemy, for for lack of a better word there. How do you look at um, time playing a factor in your life? Um, time is limited, you know. Um, it's all about what you, you do to it. It's all about 
what you do with it. Um, it's all about how you manage it. Like I have, I have four kids. My oldest is 12. So it's just like, okay, time, you know, it's like, how do you implement your time and what you need personally and what, what they need personally on a, on a time scale, you know, it's like there's 24 hours. It's just not enough time in the day. So sometimes I find myself staying awake for 48 hours just to reach 2000 words, you know? So it's just like, time but the more time um i read a book by malcolm gladwell it's called the outliers and he's like a thousand hours you know um you implement a thousand hours you can become a professional at anything that you do you know absolutely absolutely and we need to invest and that was one of the best of advice that i know that i give people you know you have to you have to hone your craft you have to be educated in that thing that you want to do as a career path you know you just have to do it. You can't slack off. You have to invest in you. So thank you for for that reminder. Now, being a first time writer can be hard for for many people. Not for everyone, but it can be for some. For others, it may come a little bit easier. Speaking of that time aspect, how did you manage your time? How did um, trying to wear all of the hats that you have to wear just to be you? How did that work out for you? Well, um, everything is just God's grace, you know. Um, it's about self. It took some time where you, you look in the mirror. It took some time where you, you shedded some tears out there where you didn't come out the bathroom. You had to lock yourself in the bathroom with your kids when at nighttime when they're in the bed because you're just like, how am I going to manage? How am I going to figure it out you know it's like and and it's like i mean weeping may endure for a night you know but it's just all about faith you know and everything like being a first-time author i haven't seen any sales like my emails has been blown up as far as like interviews and things like that but as far as like book sales or anything i have not saw that i've seen a lot of commercial success but i've not seen like financial and sometimes we don't have to do it for the financial gain the best thing is to be able to heal and share our stories um so that others may be able to heal and share our stories because like when you're on full time for god the benefits are blessings you know and there's nothing greater than his grace absolutely and you know thank you so much for for mentioning that because it is it is so very true and and sometimes we do have to we we have to grind in the beginning you know you you have to put down the work in order to reap the benefit that's that's going to come a little bit later in in life for the things that you do so you are you are so right but we now with with being a woman we we have so many hats that we have to wear you know like you said um, you could be just trying to be you, trying to be someone's best friend, trying to be someone's companion, someone's mother, someone's daughter. You know, we have so many, so many things that we have to do. Um, aside from your writing, what are some things that you do that bring you a sense of joy and happiness to kind of keep you balanced and, and to, to keep you um, from, from burning out from being an author? Um, I... I, I use, like I said, I use art, um, but I talk on the phone to a friend or um, play with my children. We have family nights and movie days and just family time in general. And just like, I'm a reader, I'm a researcher. It's like, I'm always trying to figure out like, how that doesn't make, like, I, I always got a question on something like in the world, you know, it's like, it's never ending. You know, my mind is like, it, it's like a 24 hour clock, you know, even when I'm asleep, you know, it's like, what? Like, you know, you wake yeah. up, it's like, what? Like, it's like, it's like a 24 hour clock and something that, um, like I say, just takes me away is sometimes being able to escape and, and write because I can get my biggest cheerleaders to say, oh, that's good. Or, oh, you like it? Or I could just be like, you like it? And sometimes when I just don't think it's good enough, people like the ones that just I didn't think was good, you know? So it's just like, it's just always how you touch, how you touch people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, that is such a great reminder that we do need to step away and have that that family time, you know, whom, whomever it is that you're spending your family time with. And and I know that when I say family, I am including those people that are not related to you by blood but are related to you by loyalty, you know, that, mm-hmm. that person that you guys went to kindergarten with and you're still friends, that's your family. Yeah. 
right. do need to, you know, make sure that we are spending time with those people because they really do energize us. That is, that is a great piece of advice. Now, you kind of touched on a little bit earlier that when you were a little, when you were younger, uh, things were the way that they were. Your parents did the best that they could in the situation that they were given, um, but things could have been differently. How do you as an adult um, reflect upon that, and how, how have you been able to work through any residual pain that you may have felt from an earlier time as an adult, how do you work through that pain? How do you make sure that you're not perpetuating it in your life again? How do you stay balanced when it comes to that? Well, it's all about, um, like, I, I saw therapy. You know, I went, you know, I just started opening up. Like, my life has always been an open book. I was like, I believe in those skeletons because if you you have things from the life, especially, like, if you're definitely called to ministry, whenever that comes about, it's definitely going to definitely come about. But when you're called, it's like you, there's there's nothing in the eyes, like his eyes on the sparrow, no matter what you do, you know. So it's just like, you know, I, I've always been a person to wear my heart on my sleeve. So I always took it as like, well, well, I know I'm going to repeat some things because I don't know any better. But if I'm not learning, like my mom is a great, great. She's like a real person. You know, she's definitely going to tell tell me when it's bad. She's going to tell me when it's good, you know, so she's going to be like, well, if you're not learning from your mistakes, then you're just living and there's no purpose. And if you don't have a plan and you don't have a purpose, if you don't have a purpose, then you're just out here existing. And if you're out here existing, then you're not going to exist for a very long time. I, I love it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, my last question for you today, and that is how do you think, and, and you've kind of touched on it along the way, but how do you think that your faith has really kept you um, not only afloat during times when when things were difficult, but how do you think that your faith keeps you in balance when things are going well? Um, it is it's like a stair stepper, you know. Even like when you're getting bricks thrown at you and people doubt you, you know, it's just like. Well, if I believe in myself, then there, there's nothing else. You know, my, like I say, my mom always, she's like, I want to say she's my big, biggest fan because we, we are definitely sometimes just alike, but she's definitely one of my greatest supporters in life. And she, you know, she always tell me, trust the process. You know, you, you have to, you know, change the approach. You have to just trust the process. You have to trust your process. Whatever you do, don't give up on yourself. No matter where the world takes you, no matter where life takes you, never give up on yourself because at the end of the day, it's about what you have to leave for your children, you know, and there, there's no one mistake that's greater, greater than the, what you learn from, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's no such thing as mistakes if you're learning from mistakes, you know? So it's just like, we all make poor decisions and we all make poor choices, but through faith, everything is, everything is redeemable, you know? Um, with, with, without faith, we, we are just walking, walking zombies, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Before I let you go, though, can you remind me? And one last time, what is the title of your book? Where can we get a copy? And of course, how do we stay in contact with you? Yes, um, the title of my book is A Series of Unfortunate Events. It is on all major platforms, Amazon, Kindle, and your mobile bookstore, Google Play. Um, you can stay in contact with me. I have a Twitter, at Miss Authorist. Um, yes, that's it. Thank you again for being a guest on the show today. Thank you. And listeners, thank you for tuning in and spending time with us as well. As always, may the Lord continue to shine his face upon you. May you receive his grace and his mercy in all that you do. Until next time, everyone, remember, you, you are blessed in the Lord. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.